Welcome back to the Game Collection. Today I'm going to be taking a look at a Squaresoft RPG that sometimes doesn't get the love it deserves. I am Super Derek, and this what? is Mystic no, Quest. No, not that crap. Review something good. Something Sega. But, Daria, where are you, anyway? It doesn't matter. Just review Shining Force. But... Now! <sighs> okay, okay... The Sega Genesis is a console that doesn't really get a whole lot of attention on my channel, which is a real shame. It's not one that I think of when talking about RPGs, but it's a very competent system. And also, I haven't really given much love to strategy RPGs either, which is also a big problem. And lastly, Daria is an awesome YouTuber who I think you guys should definitely check out, so I guess today we're going to be killing three birds with one stone. We're going to be reviewing... Shining Force. Damn skippy we are. In ages long forgotten, Sega's first party developer, Sonic Software Planning, who, despite the name, never actually software planned any Sonic titles, teamed up with Climax Entertainment to produce an almost Saturday morning cartoon take on the wizardry school of dungeon crawling RPGs. Shining in the Darkness was a success, and they immediately followed up with the similarly styled tactical RPG Shining Force. Thus, the concept of the Shining series was born, a slew of RPGs with different mechanics united by a single universe and cohesive art style. However, the project fell apart during production of the action RPG Shining Rogue, in which Climax essentially grabbed their developmental ball and went home. Shining Rogue was rebranded Landstalker, and Sonic Software Planning took complete creative control of the Shining series with Shining Force 2 and onwards. Later, they'd change their name to Camelot Software and develop five more Shining RPGs for the Sega Saturn before they ditched Sega for Nintendo and became that company who makes those Mario sports games and, oh, Golden Sun. In Climax, they too left Sega to develop the Stalker series before disbanding and rebranding as Matrix Software and developing the best darn Zelda clone in existence, Alundra. But that's another... where was I? Oh, right. Rest in peace, Shining Force. Your light burned bright, but short. Wait, what? Daria, I'm pretty sure I heard about some more recent Shining Force titles recently. The Shining series died with the Saturn. Huh, weird. I guess I must have been mistaken. In Shining Force, you take on the role of Max, a dashing heroic type who happens to be gifted in the use of a sword. Unfortunately, the time comes when Max is forced to use it. While sent out on a mission to prevent Kane from opening the Shining Path, his hometown, Guardiana, comes under siege. In order to prevent the resurrection of an ancient evil Dark Dragon, Max embarks on a journey with his posse to build an army and defeat Dark Soul. What's interesting about Shining Force that isn't immediately apparent when you start it up is that the game doesn't actually take place in a typical fantasy setting. With all this talk of shining paths, dark dragons, swords and such, you could be forgiven for mistaking this as a typical medieval fantasy. In fact, there's very little to contradict this. There are centaurs out there, and skeletons, and castles, and tropes that feel right at home in a C.S. Lewis-inspired fantasy. But gradually, you start to see these oddities around. Castles with rooms full of pipes, and the occasional odd piece of technology, and then eventually entire rooms full of computer mainframes, and terminals, and robots, cyborg skeletons, and eventually bright green laser-looking swords. It's an odd yet charming mix of fantasy and science fantasy that feels very unique and welcome in a genre that seldom sees this sort of playfulness in the setting. That said, the events within the plot don't exude the same level of creativity. The overall story of the game feels pretty basic, at least on the Sega Genesis version that we reviewed. I heard that there was actually quite a lot of plot that was lost in translation. The translation and story were expanded upon in the Game Boy Advance version of the game, and there are also some whole new scenarios added to that version, but I didn't really get a chance to take a look at that release. What did you think of the Game Boy Advance title, Daria? Eh. I mean, it's kind of ugly and a, dear lord, why is the saturation turned up to eye bleed? And despite the return of the series' first character artist, Yoshitaka Tamaki, the character portraits lost a lot of their original charm. But the one thing I think the remake did very well was flesh out the backstories of Max and his assorted companions. It's definitely worth a playthrough for the expanded storyline, and seasoned Shining Force vets may appreciate the bonus character and collector card editions. But otherwise, the game mechanics are pretty much the same between the two versions. I'm sure you viewers of Derek's channel are no strangers to strategy RPGs. They all play pretty similarly. Move your units around a grid, swap blows and magic with the enemy army, win, hopefully, 
and watch a cutscene before restocking supplies at the nearest town menu. Then do it all again like 30 more times. Cue credits. But Shining Force is different. Sure, you still have the grid and the blows and the cutscenes, but that town menu? It's a town. Like a full town filled with NPCs and shops and treasure chests and Easter eggs. Basically, Shining Force's Fire Emblem meets Dragon Warrior, and it's glorious. I mean, I could understand wanting to expedite the chase to the next battle if the exploration was tedious or the suck, but Shining Force makes the intermission just as, if not more fun, than the combat. There's loads of funny NPCs to talk with and secrets to find and skits to watch. It's like going to the circus before setting off for war, only without all the death because anyone actually slain in battle can be resurrected at the nearest church for the low, low price of 10 gold per experience level. In fact, unlike other, much harder SRPGs, Shining Force encourages grinding. Retreating characters keep all earned XP, and the patient player who holds off on promoting character classes until later levels is richly rewarded with the largest possible stat gains. Shining Force, at least on the Sega Genesis, is pretty easy on the eyes. I really like the battle animations of each of the characters. One of the really cool things is during these animations you can even tell if a character has a weapon equipped or not. Sure, the animations are usually only a couple of frames, but these big beautiful pixel art attack scenes feel so satisfying to watch and really don't slow the progress of battle all too much either. Outside of battle, the character sprites are big, simple, and beautiful compared to Final Fantasy games of the time. The graphics have aged very well. Yoshitaka Tamaki's character designs shine through strongly here and in those character portraits. Composer Masahiko Yoshimura lends his considerable talents to Shining Force, bringing to the table some of the best music that I've heard in ages. A lot of people don't give the Sega Genesis the credit it deserves, and I used to be one of them too not too long ago, but Yoshimura's compositions prove that the Genesis is quite the capable machine, as long as the composer has the skills and talent to really let it roar. One of the reasons that I love Shining Force so much, besides the whole Narnia meets Star Wars thing, is that it's so accommodating to different play styles. You could completely steamroll the Runefost army with your overpowered behemoths if you take the time to pump up your squad, or stick to a strict no-grind sanction and eke out an exhilarating win by the skin of your teeth. This theme of absolute player control is reinforced even within roster building. By endgame, you'll have acquired 30 characters from which to build a small force of 12. And of those, you have your pick from mages, healers, melee fighters, flyers, and ranged attackers. The combinations are, well, there's a lot of possible armies you could build from those options. And then on top of that, there's unique weapons, stat boosting consumables, and special rings that you can use to really put that personal touch on your MVPs. And even if you decide to play through the adventure multiple times, reusing, say, the same crew of gorgeous equine gladiators, your experience will never be the same twice. Stat gains are randomized. To a point. Level ups can be as disappointing as no gains whatsoever, or as thrilling as a surge of power that suddenly transforms your dedicated healer into the hardest hitting mother f With its pick up and play mechanics and lack of permadeath, Shining Force was actually a really great introduction to me to the strategy RPG genre. And it was also a really great way for me to dust off the old Sega Genesis, which I've had sitting for far too long. And with its amazing graphics and music, I'm kind of surprised the game didn't catch my eye sooner. I guess what I'm saying, Daria, is I'm really glad that you turned me on to this series. And Shining Force has definitely earned itself a spot in the game collection. Now, there's just the small matter of you coming into my house and saying that Mystic Quest is crap. You know I can't just let you get away with that, right? The heck I can't. Wait. What exactly are you suggesting? Well, you know how you came onto my channel and we talked about Shining Force? Well, how about we head over to your channel and talk a little bit about Mystic Quest? Oh. All right. You're going to regret this. Huh? Nothing. <laughs>